And as promised, uh, friend of the show, uh, officially now, I've convinced you to maybe come on a little more regularly. How, how I mean, did, is that is that accurate or am I projecting? It is accurate. You, it didn't take a lot of convincing. I was, uh, I had a, a blast on the first uh, on the first show. So uh, excited to to come back more often. I love it. Yeah, uh, we had such a, a unbelievable response to uh, the interview we did, um, where you were so forthcoming and, and rational, uh, as per usual, about uh, some huge topics. Obviously, Halop. Uh, from when we talked about it, uh, it seems you know, it was only a month ago, but a lot's changed. Uh, she's back. She's playing. Uh, when we first had that conversation, it was more along the lines of, will she ever play again? So I think it was your good vibes that got it done, Kim. Well, maybe. <laughs> I, I don't think so. I think uh, a lot of hard work from uh, her team and everybody, uh, uh, you know, who, who tried to kind of uh, change the, uh, you know, prove her, her innocence. Um in all this right like she she i'm super happy that she was able to play and that we got to see her out on court and just to see how happy she was and how excited she was to be out there and the support that she got um i thought was was great and and what she deserved um you know you can tell that she's maybe not as as game ready as what she was you know a couple of years ago which is normal um but just the excitement to get back and i'm sure this is very you know, motivational for her to go on to the clay court season and to to really prepare uh, well for uh, for the French Open. Yeah, I I was actually impressed by the way she played. Obviously, I think fitness, uh, you know, down the the stretch was maybe lacking a little bit. But as far as ball striking, the shoulder was a little bit tired. Um, but all in all, I I felt like it was a a pretty good accounting uh, for her. I mean, she's obviously not going to like miss a, miss a ton of balls. She's super competitive. Uh, I want your take on it because I don't know. I don't know what to think of this, and you're normally pretty good at uh, being rational, um, whereas I kind of react uh, emotionally. Uh, Hala, uh, Caroline Wozniacki basically came out and said, and she was very um, cautious with the way she said it, um, but, but basically the, the gist of it was, uh, I don't believe people uh, who have doped uh, should be back and be given uh, wild cards. Now, I disagree specifically with Halep because it's a business, and obviously you want her as a storyline. But I understand, uh, I understand what Caroline is saying. I, I, I certainly respect time served. Um, Halep didn't like it. She kind of got a little defensive and said, "I'm not a cheater. I didn't dope." Um, and it was, it was, you know, she. You could tell that she was bothered, and I hope that since then she has gone back and watched the actual video of what Caroline has said, and not just. Uh, listen to a kind of regurgitation uh, of what was said, because I thought Caroline said it as nicely as she could, given the fact that she has an opinion, which even if you don't agree with it, is is a rational uh, opinion. The thing that throws this thing into a, a, a little bit of a, a weird area is Halep was, was on record in 2017 when Sharapova came back um, after time served and was given wild card saying, absolutely, under no circumstances, you know, someone who has tested positive should be allowed uh, wild cards. Uh, it seems like Halep's uh, opinion has changed uh, based on her own circumstance. Uh, what are we to make of this? Um, well, I have a lot of thoughts. Um, first of all, I think every situation, although it comes out as a positive doping result, right? Test. Uh, I think in Halep's situation, it's completely different. Uh, her situation, um, she tested positive unknowingly, right? With a contaminated supplement. Like, I do think that there is, if somebody is taken, like we see in cycling or whatever, like does, I don't know the terms or, or you know, about all the medical products and all that stuff. I don't know that, but like, yeah, when somebody tests positive very strongly for a supplement or for something that is taken because of um, you want to become a better athlete. Yes, 100%. I agree with what Caroline says. Like, you know, we shouldn't, they need to start from the bottom. Like they have to work their way up, um, being clean, get tested often and, uh, and work your way, way back, back to the top. But I think in Simona's case, and again, like we come back to, you know, what we talked about previously, like her team made such a big mistake. I, I, I'm, and by the way, on that point, I, feel, I have a lot of sympathy for her because of misplaced trust. We should know, we should test, we shouldn't blindly trust. She did. I feel like she was kind of manipulated a little bit. So I completely agree with you on that point. Yeah. So that's where I do think like and her reaction 
is like, listen, I didn't cheat. And her saying something about Maria in the past, to me, only shows her vision of how she looks at doping and that she's not a cheater, like when it comes to to, to, to taking doping and, and to use that to become a better athlete. I do believe that. Yeah, the, the, the word intent is weird because you can say, I didn't dope, I'm not a doper, and I think it should be, I didn't intentionally dope. <laughs> because if you test positive, you have taken a performance enhancing drug. So you can't say like, I didn't purposely cheat. I didn't knowingly cheat. I didn't, but you can't say like, I'm, yeah, not, accidentally, I'm not this. Right? Like, accidentally. So, and it's a weird thing too, because the Sharapova, I feel like, you know, she, it, it, I've asked a couple of people just to try to get smarter. And it feels like people judge uh, the Maria situation different because of the reputation of of meldonium right and so it's like well that was a performance enhancer just wasn't illegal well i'm like okay isn't that every supplement like every supplement you take is taken for the benefit of what to make your body feel better to make you feel better to enhance performance so her saying i didn't know when it went from illegal uh sorry from legal to illegal uh it, it's just a it's just a weird uh, I feel right. like it, you know, it's, it's, it's like a weird thing where it's like, well, that, you know, it was a, it was a performance enhancing supplement. I'm like, well, that's every right. supplement though. Right. But like, I mean, my feel on it all is, you know, all like products, they come onto the market, right? There's somebody who creates something to try and make some, some athlete better. I think Russia, like there was a huge documentary years ago that I watched in Belgium about, um, you know, these Russian labs where they create products to, to help pl like players, their athletes, whether it doesn't matter whether it's, you know, any sport, not just tennis players, any, any athlete to, to improve and to try and get away, you know, to try and kind of sneak a new product in and get benefits from it. Right. Like that's, you know, the, yeah, that's how it, it works, I guess, in a sense. And, and so whatever meldonium or I think, there, you take a product, um, and you're right. Like Maria didn't take that, you know, because it was like it wasn't a banned substance. Like, like so, so it's it's there's no blame. Like there's you know yeah, for that. I, like, I just I, I guess for my thing is like I didn't have a problem with what Caroline said, even if there is nuance in every case. I don't like. I mean, obviously, Halep comes back. I think you need to come back with a general under, general understanding that you can't assume every single person knows every exact thing that happened in your trial. I think that's presumptuous, especially on the heels of your previous statements, not giving the grace to someone who you also might not have known all of the elements of their case. I just kind of, I'm someone who like craves consistency and it seems like there's a uh, an inconsistency in opinion based on personal circumstance, right? Uh, and I, I don't want, you know, I, I hope Halep went back and watched the Wozniacki thing just because I don't feel like she was taking shots even in the slightest. Like, I don't, and, I don't no, it was just her opinion. Like, maybe a journalist asked, asked Simona that question in the press. Totally. You know how it goes, right? Totally. Like, oh, Caroline said this. And, and you know, like, you, they create kind of a, a story. Um, so, but again, like, what I always try to think about, I don't know if you hear the snoring. Um, it's not my husband it's, laying yeah, on I was the about couch to say, are you, to are you doing this podcast while someone, there <laughs> it is. A little bulldog right there. Fellow English bulldog <laughs> owner. Dreamland. I, I was um, going to ask about it. I don't know if you're like passing wind or something. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I just try to like think about the situation and I try to, believe that I've always been very cautious. And when, you know, my team have, has done things, you know, to, yeah, where I was sick or like, did you check it? Like, I, yeah, we checked it with the WTA. Like if that gets told to you, like I wasn't going to send th those emails out to the WTA or, you know, like, so you have to trust your team. And if, if you do that and I don't know where that communication went wrong within the team, like I do feel differently about that. Like, I do yeah. feel differently I, I, about that. I think it comes down to Halep taking something new from something from someone who gave it to her. You take those things to enhance performance, and it's pretty straight. It's either legal 
or it's not. And there's a clear line in the sand where in Maria's case, it's generally known that, you know, she had taken that for a long time and it was viewed negatively, I, I think, in, in the world of sports. Um, but it was known, like everyone knew what it was. Everyone felt like the ban on meldonium specifically was coming. I think they're both guilty of crossing T's, dotting I's, and you got to know what's legal, when it's legal, who's giving it to you, what are the trusted sources. Uh, I am glad that I am not uh, responsible for choosing what happens and what the guidelines are uh, for the Hall of Fame with these two, because obviously, because obviously they're they're first ballot Hall of Famers, uh, in my opinion. Um, I think the easiest thing for the Hall of Fame to do, and this is me projecting uh, to El Presidente uh, of the Hall of Fame right now, but it, it feels like an opportunity to celebrate how tough the drug testing protocols are in tennis. Like, you know, you hear positive for you know something that has 17 vowels. Uh, three X's in it and, you know, four other, you know, letters that you can, can barely pronounce together. And that's like the technical term for aspirin. Sounds like the Belgian language. No, I'm only <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, it, I think it's an opportunity to say, listen, we're going to have some, the, the reason why we've had some of these positives, it is so strict, right? You can test positive for Sudafed. You can test positive. You used to be able to test positive for athlete's foot powder, like these are insane things to test positive for, but that you don't have to worry about uh, in other sports. We should celebrate the fact that, like, intent. No one's taking anabolic steroids and testing positive for that. Like, that's just not happening. Uh, I don't think it's our job, your job, uh, at the Hall of Fame uh, with your team there to uh, diagnose intent. That's been done in the courts. Simply. If the courts and the systems have said this was not intentional and it's an imperfect system, so we can go down that rabbit hole if you want, it's not uh, the job of the Hall of Fame to overrule a court to then judge on intent and celebrate the fact that we get tested more than any athletes on earth. We get tested in our home. We get tested with blood. They can randomly knock on your door at five in the morning and you have to pee in a cup. Like, it is a simultaneously a chance to punt responsibility because I don't think it's the job of the Hall of Fame to try to qualify intent. I think there's time served, and I think there should be a level that's not Sudafed or something that's over the counter. Uh, there does need to be some differentiated, but the problem is we consume in headlines, and that's a tough headline to write. But uh, wh where do you stand on that? Is I mean, am, I, am I missing something? Have I not thought about no, something? No, you said it all. <laughs> you said it all. Can you join me when I uh, in my meetings at the Hall of Fame? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna jump on that grenade. You made that okay, mistake, not right. me. Uh, and um, we got. I, no, I, kinda, I agree. Go like ahead. it's it's. Um, you know, and and the voters, they may have a personal opinion about it, but I don't think, um, yeah, it needs to have an effect um, once the the suspension is everything is passed and, and life goes on. And um, yeah, you know, I, I, I just I, I just think the easiest thing ever is to celebrate how stringent and that we have the toughest drug testing protocols yeah. in any sport on Earth, maybe outside of just general olympic protocols where the only way you're getting away with something if it's like a balco situation where there's a de designer steroid someone has to go and tell on them and tell them what to look for and then all of a sudden you pick off 50 baseball players uh because you know they they weren't able to test for what the what was being taken this feels like a different uh, i remember scenario. like like back in the day especially like when you had like a good result i would have like three days in a row of random like it was like it was the the Fe the belgian federation it was ITF, yep. Yep. and then you had like whatever else there was. Like I, it was crazy. Like and and I never knew that there were so many different organizations that can come in and have the rights to come and test you. Like it's, uh, but it was it was very obvious that you know, especially when you had a good result, um, and um, yeah, they like to come knock on your door. And uh, I mean, I remember one time, like I just went to pee literally like three minutes before and all of a sudden i hear like ding dong like in belgium yep. my front door it was like five to six and they and sit I, and watch you until you have to go again yeah and they yep. sit there in your kitchen and i was just trying <laughs> to be polite like you can't do anything and you can't go anywhere like i can't go and take a nap until i have to pee again like no i have to stay there and stay inside and i was like would you like some coffee and they're like no we're not allowed to take anything from you know the i'm like okay 
So you pro- just literally you want, just you, sit there do, at a do, do you, do you, <laughs> very awkward. Do you want some coffee with supplements crushed into it? <laughs> no? I heard it. We'll go on after this because this was literally a side tangent that I thought would take two minutes, but then it became uh, interesting, I think. Um, we weren't going to go this deep on this subject, but here we are. Uh, one of the stories that... No, but Andy, but have you yeah. never been in a situation where like a trainer or somebody says like, I don't know, like, it's a good lesson for the younger generation, yes. I feel like, right? Like to, to really take this as an example for coaches, for like everybody yeah. involved, like trainers, physios, whoever. Um, yeah. So it's, it's a also, great lesson. Like, yeah, it, it's and okay. So now I'm going another one. I get asked often uh, about, you know, certain players and is there a, what's, is there a problem with, with, with drug testing or s- steroid use or something in tennis? And I say, well, like just very pragmatically, right? The cost of to pass the testing that Lance Armstrong was was passing was millions of dollars a year. Like that was a whole operation of very clinical, very organized uh, people on salary, people hiding stuff, moving from here to there. It literally cost millions. Frankly speaking, ninety nine percent of tennis players can't afford the program that it would take to consistently (laughs) dodge the drug testing because it is so effective. The only thing we can't solve for is what we don't know, like a Balco uh, situation. So I hate that the headlines make it seem like there's an issue in tennis when it's actually, when someone tests positive, it's because of the strength of of, uh, the doping. It's like during an Olympic year, God forbid, you get tested, you land in France, you get tested by their federation, you get tested by all your Olympic committees, you get tested by the uh, ITF, you get tested by the ATP, the slams have their own testing. I mean, when, and it's weighted based on rankings. So Kim, not understanding that she got tested a lot after a good result was because she was always good. Uh, And it was weighted, that the drug testing was weighted by ranking. (laughs) That was like a subtle flex there. Um, But uh, yeah, I mean, listen, it's, it's not an issue in tennis. Uh, but it should be a lesson learned for the young players, like Kim said. Like, I, I would be so, I was ridiculous about any, I wouldn't take cough medicine, even if it was, even yeah, if it was like. Yeah, but we recently had a player in the yeah. WTA tour who tested positive, and they were able to prove that the meat that they ate in South America yep. had like hormone, like certain types of hormones in it. And, you know, it was such a minimum, yeah, result, yep. but it's crazy. Like, it's, it's, um, yeah. So don't, and especially don't with eat. social media now, everything too, because everything yeah, is, yeah. you know, it's, it's hard to, the, 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 you can't put the toothpaste back in on social media. Like once it's said once, that's just accepted by, you know, 50% of everyone. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't really, we've proven in many different areas that we don't really work well with nuance. Um, but anyways, uh, take this out. I hope, I hope Simona and Caroline just get together and have a 90 second conversation as I imagine they will. And I hope that's just over. Um, but anyways, it was good to see, uh, Halep back. Uh, one of the other things and why, um, we were texting the last two days and I basically threw the hail Mary out if, and asked if you would regularly come on. Um, it seemed very, you've been top of mind this week for me. Um, even more than when I just text you random stuff, uh, usually is because it feels like the entire tours, are so comeback centric right now, right? Like I was writing down the names and I'll miss a couple. So let me know what I miss, uh, Kim and producer Mike. But it's like, okay, Nishikori, we're still talking about Wozniaki. Radu Kanu stopping and starting. It feels like there's always a comeback. Kerber coming back, Svitolina coming back. Team has been it, like this long comeback that doesn't look like it's going to end well uh, at this point. I hope it does. Murray's been on this like three year, you know, can I break through? I, I've, I've come back and I'm at a certain level and it's admirable, but. am I still happy, you know, being someone who's 50 in the world and having those moments? Osaka coming back. Is Rafa going to be able to come back for one last run? Halep coming back. So you, like, your take on this is going to be very interesting to me because maybe I'm forgetting someone, but I think you were, you you probably had the best comeback of all time, most sustainable. uh, You could argue even not, maybe not as far as volume because, you you know, you played longer before, but uh, the most impactful results of your career were after you came back uh, the first time and then you stopped and then you tried again in, within the last three or four years and it, it seemed like it didn't get off the ground. So I think you're like the perfect person to ask 
and talk about the difficulties of, you know, what's different with Radakanu coming back when she's young versus, uh, you know, Kerber or Rafa trying to fight back when they can't really trust their body. What were the differences between a successful comeback for you? And maybe you view the second one as it was successful because I tried, but it, it wasn't as if, you know, you, you played, you know, three years straight healthy and you had a run and you ended up in the top 10 again. So did, kind of describe the differences between, you know, what was probably the most successful comeback of all time and one that maybe you wanted more out of. Well, to keep it very simple and the feeling that I have about coming back after I Jada, um, I was in my mid twenties. It, everything just went very smoothly. You know, I had with my trainer back in Belgium, we had the numbers that we wanted to get to, whether it came down to kind of speed and agility, um, strength, uh, you know, all the numbers that we had from the past. Like I felt like I got to those numbers very quickly. Um, I got my feeling back on the court, the motivation, which was something that for me was always super important is, is the seeing, you know, being motivated, motivated to take on the challenge of trying to work my way back into, you know, into, into the tournaments. And then, um, in my later, so what was that? Mid thirties, I guess. Um, it was, everything was just so much harder. Like in my brain, I felt like, you know, yeah, I can maybe not be as good as before, but you know, my goal tried to be second week of grand slams, like, you know, trying to play, the Grand Slams a week prior, maybe a couple of tournaments here and there. Um, that was the goal. And I mean, stupid enough, my knee injury that kind of lingered throughout the whole, that whole phase, I was playing Padel and I slipped and I had a tore my MCL, like something really stupid. And, and, um, and I never recovered properly from it. Like, and it's, yeah, just being older and it, you know, there's a great part about getting older is that you know yourself better. You are able to read games better. I, I'm able to, I understand the game better than before. I understand myself better than before. Um, but physically it just, yeah, I wasn't able to. And then that becomes frustrating. You be, you get, you get frustrated with your body, with yourself, and you try to kind of fight through it and you think, okay, I have to be disciplined. I'm going to try new things. But then yeah, at the end of the day, you have to realize COVID kicked in there too. And I just wasn't able to, to maintain the, you know, the, the, the daily push or the motivation to, to get to that point and to leave the family behind. And, um, and so I just called it quits, but it was kind of like, to me, I compare my last kind of comeback as like my girlfriend's who try to run a marathon before they're 40, <laughs> you know, like that's like, they need a challenge like that. And I was like, yeah, this is my marathon. Like I'm trying to do this and, and, and I know I'm going to get criticized, like, but I'm going to try it. A and... Professional tennis comeback where she played, she came back and played in the U S open to medals for exercise. Like that's what that, that, that that's the comp. Seriously that's like, though. Like, that's but Kim's that's reality my girlfriend versus like, oh mortal, my God, like... mortal reality. It, but it's true like my girlfriends were like i want to try to run the marathon in rotterdam or in amsterdam or That's berlin cute. and yeah bless you and, yeah so <laughs> try to do it <laughs> did age uh did age create its own pressure circumstances so like if you if you're 22 and you have a setback unless it's like a major major blowout where it's something crazy you know you're going to get back you're just disappointed that you're missing time right? Like you hurt your knee. It, did it create its own sort of mental? I mean, I understand the physical part, but the, like a mental pressure set where For it's sure. like, I don't have four years, I have 12 months. And yep. does that make it less enjoyable somehow? I kind of like that, that battle of like trying to push and see how far, you know, like the, the grind of like, working with your trainer, like in the basement here, like to, to see like, how far can I push this? Like, where can this knee go? And, and, and like, I kind of like that, that pushing yourself. Um, did it cause pressure? Maybe a little bit. Um, I do have to say like, I, um, uh, so the year that the Indian Wells tournament got canceled, uh, because of COVID pushed to um, October, right? Yep. I was yep. there and had gr I had my first ever panic attack in my life. Tell me about that. Yeah. So that was like, you talk about like pressure. Like, I think I felt 
pressure like i wanted to do well like i felt like i was hitting the ball so well on court like i i, I remember hitting with kiki burtons and and with alia tomlianovic and and just i had such good practices like played practice sets was was beating girls in practice and but i just wanted to kind of prove it like in in, in a match and um and during one of the practices i just started like yeah really like i had a panic attack on the tennis court what never had that like? in what, my life what does that feel like when it happens it felt uh, like, like I, don't, I don't think i've had for one, a second so. i felt like i was being a drama queen so that's like most of us daily take him. <laughs> Can I put my middle finger up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's a podcast. There you, yeah, there, yeah, there you go. At least um, we, we have our new show opening. That's great. <laughs> It'll live forever. No, but like, I was like, what is happening, Kim? Just take a deep breath. Calm down. Like, that's how I tried to talk like to myself. Like a heart rate into... thing? No, like I couldn't take a deep breath. Like oh. I was like, huh. And my trainer was there. Like I was on court, I think it was court four or something in Indian Wells. And, um, and so my trainer was like, just lay down, put your legs up. And that like me calming down or that wasn't working at all. So I was like, just give me like, go stand like to my tennis coach, go stand at the net and just hit, like hit towards me. So I had the, the rhythm of the sound of the ball, like the dunk, the dunk, like, like that distraction. And that gave me like my, my breathing wow. rhythm came back. And yeah, I talked to him about it the other day because he's now working with, with Ons Jabur a little bit. And, um, and when I was in Indian Wells, like I called him, like, remember the, the, the panic attack? Yeah, it was crazy. That's so, it's so strange how like pressure manifests because like outside looking in, right, our, our listeners are probably going, okay, uh, you know, You've had this successful career. You don't owe anyone anything. Your legacy is set in stone. Uh, you have a happy family. Uh, I know that you like your husband most of the time. Um, <laughs> like, it, it seems like everything's set. So therefore, there shouldn't be. There's certainly not any outside pressure uh, on you, right? It's not as if no, anyone's going. No, you create going, if Kim, that yourself. Kim, I think. I know, right? but that's fascinating to me. And and but like, talk about how that works because normally pressure is like outside. I need to win a slam. I know I have to. I know I can. There's expectation i think i always say expectation i think is the hardest thing uh in sports right i think like the expectation is 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 hard but at that point outside of your own expectations like with everyone like the world's expectations you were always fine like you always dealt with, like not fine but it was hard let's give it the credit it deserves but it didn't end in you having a panic attack on the court so outside looking in it's like it's 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 surprising for me to hear that your own pressure set of just wanting to play well in a match when you've done it hundreds of times yeah. in your career was the thing that set it off. That's fascinating to me. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, um, it came out of nowhere and it really, like, I remember walking off the, the, the court back to the locker room and, and just thinking to myself, like, wh like, where is this coming from? Like you really start to kind of unpeel the onion. Like, like, is this coming because I want to do well for my team? Cause I know that they're, you know, they're there and they want me to do well. And we've worked so hard on getting my knee ready and like all those things. And yeah, it's, it's, I don't know. Like I still at times, like, I know I put a lot of pressure on myself and I tried to push it. And, you know, I'm also at the same time thinking like my family wasn't there, like I'm doing this. Brian and the kids are at home. Like, is this the right thing to do? You know, like that kind of fight, like that battle inside that of your head that, yeah, the guilt that you, yeah. you know, that I dealt with in, in my mid twenties, but you got over quickly and, 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 um, you're able to, yeah, you balance it easier, but this just, um, yeah, it just didn't, didn't feel right. Man, I didn't, I, I think one of my favorite things that I'm surprised about from doing the show and one of my, like the best things is that I learned something new that I would have never assumed from the outside looking in. And these are people, you're, you're friends. Like I'm close with James. I know Max, I've traveled with Brad forever, but I always learned something new that I would have been wrong on uh, w with an assumption. And I think that's my favorite part of, of, of having done this show uh, so far. And I, the, I don't know what the macro takeaway is. It's like someone's always going through something, right? Like right. even, if, you, even right. if it's not obvious to you, uh, yeah. can I tell you about something I went through this morning, Kim? Please do. Yeah. Not quite uh, a panic, no panic attack. attack. 
<laughs> but I certainly fucking freaked out. I'll tell you that. Um, so I, <laughs> I've started playing. So this is this would be especially funny to you uh, because I said after Kim and I played, and we said this in the last one, we played an EXO the week before the U.S. Open. It was so bad. Like I felt <laughs> like I had played tennis four times in my life. I was panicked. <laughs> And it was like someone would hit. And it got to the point where I made it so awkward during this exhibition where the other two players knew that they couldn't hit it to me because I would miss if it was past serve. It was like I was missing, but it was it was bad. And I was just like that. If, if there would have been any consequence, I think that would have been my first panic attack. Uh, so I, I basically left the court and came, you know, I was like, I'm never playing in public ever again in my life. That was it. I came home. I said I told Brooke the same thing. Uh, I don't think I have since. <laughs> Uh, but six months ago, I started playing a lot more tennis. I maybe played three times a year for, you know, seven years before that. Play a ton. I play in a, a game called Dingles. Do you know what Dingles is? I do, though. I learned yeah. since I moved to the States. Oh, my God. It's like the best game. I had no idea. It's so fun. Anyways, so it's like basically this game where you you there's two points going on simultaneously. You and your partner are playing a, a cross-court singles point. Whoever wins, you hear Dingle shout it, and then it opens up to all four people. It's a dumb game. I have a, a really fun game here in town with, you know, some player. One guy played at Wimbledon. One guy's like the best in the country over 50, like a high level game. And it's been great for me. I've lost a bunch of weight. I'm playing tennis again. I love it again. I, I am enjoying it more now than any time, you know, since I was like nine, right? Like you enjoy tennis while you're playing, but there's also like, it's your job. So it's, it's just different. I wrapped a racket uh, around a bench. <laughs> Got in a fight with someone I was playing with. All right, but what happened? <laughs> they were accusing me of cheating, and it really just fucking pissed me off. Um, and so I wrapped a racket around a bench. Uh, there were two other guys. I'd said something <laughs> to the one guy, and then I left. And I made the excuse. I'm like, I have, I have, I have to shoot a podcast with Kim at 11:30. I just huff and puffed and left, um, <laughs> and completely lost it. And I'm like, you. And then like, the whole time, I'm like driving home, and I'm like. You simple bastard. Like, I, it was like, oh, I, got, I was, kept getting accused. It was like two days in a row where I got accused uh, and they were actually ended up being wrong about the rule, right? So I'm like, I felt like validated yesterday. I'm like, see, like how stupid is that? And then today I could hear this guy chirping to his partner, like that middle line. Like I, I have many things. I have many flaws. I call a wide line. Like I don't, I, I don't never had the umpire call to me as a junior. Just don't do it. Like I err on the other side of it. This guy chirping, I didn't say anything, did the same guy as yesterday. And someone I've known for like ever, uh, he played in Wimbledon. And sure enough, like, and then happens again. And he's like, was that out? I go, are you asking me because you didn't hear me call it or because you're questioning me? And he goes, because it was in and I'm questioning you. And I was, I, I replayed it. I'm like, fine, whatever. Like the rule is you have to be a hundred percent. I'm sure like every club player right now is on the edge of their seats going, I do this every Wednesday. <laughs> so... But like this is basically a story like we're just like you. Uh, so I said, well, replay it. I ended up replaying it yesterday, too, even though I was completely right. Right. It's like I, I get like this little bitchy tone like, well, I'll just replay it then because I'm not going to take it. Like just being a just a just a drama queen, like you said earlier. Anyway, so and then the more I think about it, like 10, 15 minutes ago, I'm sure me losing that game didn't help my my general state of being. And I just fucking snapped. Like I haven't snapped. I don't. I don't snap nowadays. Like I know I was nuts when I was on tour, but it's not as if I walk. I don't lose my temper really. Like I don't. I'm. I'm obviously quick and I like banter, but not like wrecking things or breaking rackets. And I, I just don't. I don't throw things at the wall when I'm mad. I don't punch the air when I'm mad. I lost it, and I'm still pissed right now. Like it's been three hours, and I'm. I'm. I'm so <laughs> pissed diagnose me so it was the buildup it was the buildup of the last few days snapped snap fooey <laughs> and i was literally you were ready at 11 15 i normally come down at 11 15 it was 11 27 we were supposed to start at 11 30 and producer my producer bike's going come down she's ready i'm like i still have three minutes i but it was because i was text arguing with the guy still <laughs> <laughs> and I'm I'm mad because I like he he works at the place we play and I got mad at him at his place of work so I felt guilty. I'm like this is your job like I can't bring my petulance into your job. And so I kind of owned my part of it, which I'm good at. Like I can do stupid things yeah. but then I can own my stupid things. I'm good at that. 
He's, and you have he a just, podcast. Where he, you won't, can he won't own prove it. your like point. He, he hasn't said sorry for any of it. And he was completely wrong yesterday, like on on merit on all of it. And so I'm just I, I think just he need, wants I, it. I think he wants like a frame thing that he beat you and then No, but he's beaten me before. It's like we used to practice together all the time. Like it's not like he hasn't it, it, he doesn't view me that way. Like he oh, he played okay. he was one he was 140 in the world. He played Wimbledon. Like it's it's not it, it's not like that thing where it's a club guy beating me. Like which which is like it, it is a thing but not specifically with him, but I uh, basically <laughs> thank you for being a part of the podcast. I can't wait for you to be here on a semi-regular basis. <laughs> Uh, I bet you didn't know that you're my new therapist and we're going to do it very publicly. <laughs> well, uh, vi uh, vice versa. Like you can be my therapist at the yeah. same time. Keep yeah. We'll just pretend no one's listening. Airy. <laughs> yeah. So is that, am I like you, obviously that never had, that didn't even have, you didn't even get mad when like there were actual consequences. Is that like a psychotic thing to do? Like break stuff? Andy, like maybe this will surprise a lot of people, but not the people that are close to me, but I do like to throw things sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how does that work? Because I, no one's ever seen you get mad publicly. Like, what, what happens? Uh, well, on the tennis court, I definitely, like, in practice, and or if it's pickleball, or, like, wait, it's whatever wait, I have in my hand. Like, if it's a tennis ball, like, I will throw my shoulder out trying to throw the ball, like, just to get some, like, frustration out. If it's a racket, like I've definitely cracked a, a few rackets in my career. Never on the, uh, during the game, though. Like that's oh. when like I was in focus mode. But um, yeah, but like yeah, not, not not so much at the house. But it's always the yeah when the competitiveness stuff gets that's triggered, Wait. and when it's unfair, when there's unjust like unjustified that's things it. happening. Like that's, that's it. it. I hate being accused of yeah that's... of being shifty. That I can't yeah. get over it. I can't no. get over it. Yeah. It just drives I, me crazy. Like if someone's like, you're shifty. I'm like, oh, or you're, you're squirrely with the rules. And then you go back. It's like, okay, maybe I'm wrong. You go back and, and ask the group. And they're like, no, that's not even a, like what you're being accused of. Isn't even a rule. I can't get over it. And it, it literally, I've had 24 hours to get over it. And I went in today and on any other day, we all chirp, we all talk, we all quite like we all, it's just, you know, trash talking. And it was build up and I just, I lost it. I couldn't handle it. So what were you thinking on your way over, like in the car, on the way to, 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 to were you already like worried about it? No, I <laughs> thought I was good. That's the concerning part. Like I thought I was fine. I, well, and it, this is an excuse, um, but like I'm on tennis channel all for the next, you know, however many masters 1000s when they're in Miami, like I don't, I go on after the last match. So daughter comes in at five 30. I went to sleep at like one 30. So I woke up kind of like grumpy, right? Not an excuse. I drove there thinking like I was over it. I texted last night. I'm like, ah, oh, there's not gonna be a hangover. It's all fine. Like I texted our little tennis group. I was wrong. There was a hangover. I was pissed. So when are you playing with them again? <laughs> I don't know. We've. I think at this point we've. We're like we're never gonna play again. I would like just put a little camera on in the corner so we can just maybe have some footage of that when we. Uh, I'll take care of it for the podcast. <laughs> yeah, I, we need it. Can I? Can I? Before, I know I've taken a lot of your time today. Uh, I do want you to weigh in on one other thing that I've been dealing with this week, if you if 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 you can. Uh, so my wife. Um, oh yes. Who you know? Do you know what this is? Is it about the treadmill? Yeah, tell me about it. Yeah. What were you thinking? No, no, no. That's some bullshit. Okay, so <laughs> wait. You gotta frame. You gotta frame it. You gotta. Frame I it. saw. I saw uh, a video on yeah, Brooklyn's me. Instagram, which I don't have. She, so this is all a surprise to me. Where she is asking i guess her followers like hey what do you think about this um <laughs> i it is her i guess her birthday coming up mother's day it's yeah. her your anniversary uh, how many 15 years how many 15 see that's a big one like i know <laughs> yeah so and she goes and andy bought me a treadmill <laughs> <laughs> I cried I cried laughing like hilarious. Um, okay. So all right, so now your side. Okay. Uh so I learned about this in parts. So I, we were in here shooting who were we was it Monday? Were we shooting yeah, it the was, it was Monday. racket roundup? Like so I was in here solo. I wasn't doing like a conversation or an interview. And social Sophie uh she, she does an un unbelievable job for our social accounts. Uh, she also, you know, helps us with our 
with our children. And so she was in here in the studio while we were shooting. And she's like, oh, did you see what Brooke just put on Instagram? I'm like, obviously, I don't have Instagram. I have no idea what it is. And so I had, and, and the way that it would, had done was she literally has been talking about this fucking treadmill for months, right? She's like, I, I like to do this certain workout on my off days. And like, it's become like a thing. And when we're building out the studio, like what you see here is out in our gym in our backyard. Like this is, this whole studio is in there. So it's like moving equipment and her whole thing was like, well, I just want to make sure that that treadmill that we may or may not eventually get fits in there. Like that was a point of conversation. So it's been there for a while. And so I was like, okay, uh, the misinformation, Kim, which I just, I just want to clear my name. I've already curious. admitted. I'm so curious now. I've admitted my petulance. I've admitted <laughs> my in, immaturity uh, on this show already. Uh, the treadmill was for one of the things. All right. So like we, and also one thing I learned is because I don't care about gifts doesn't mean that nobody else should, should, shouldn't care about gifts. Right. Like that's, that's that I own that. Uh, someone else gave me a piece of advice. It was like major occasions. You shouldn't be allowed to plug it in. That's good advice. That's clarity. I understand that. Right. Like that's a, that's, a, it might've been your wife, Mike. Like that was, a, that, that, that's a good piece of advice. The misinformation where again, fair and just, I just can't get over it is it was for one of the things. And the only reason I told her ahead of time was because she was going to going to go order it and I had already ordered it. Right. And so it was for a birthday. There's a separate gift for Mother's Day, and there is a separate gift for the anniversary. And <laughs> she just went and gaslit my ass Good. on Instagram. <laughs> you know what made it even better was I think the next video where she was sharing like all the women that had gotten like horrible gifts from their, like one great. got like a, no, no, a listen, vacuum, the, the other great. one got like, a no. scale. The other <laughs> The content was great, and I was like, I'm not even going to respond on Twitter. I'm not going to do anything. Because... I heard your voice, though, on, on one of the videos in the background or something. Yeah, because she was shooting it, like, and I'm next to her. And she knows that if she says something and I'm next to her, I can't help myself. Like, she's just... She's she was great. A, she was she's a con great. She I, makes me laugh. I like her. Um, yes. She was a... But, I like, that's content mastery, right? But, again, the... But... the, the <laughs> A lie, even, tra even a, a, li a lie travels halfway around the world before the truth gets spoken. Like that's, that's, that's the, yeah. But you think just it generally, you, okay. So you're about to tell me that either way I shouldn't have gotten her a treadmill, right? Um, you get it for the two of you, not for oh, like a dig. special occasion. Like. Got it. I'll, I'll start running Kim. Jesus. <laughs> Fuck. Um, Listen, I, I remember, I think it was your 40th where she like threw a bunch of pictures of you like yeah. on there too. Hilarious. Yeah. I don't know where it's, like they, she yeah. found all those pictures. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> one piece of context that also I just wanted to say for the end is that she conveniently forgot that it's got to be seven or eight years ago now. I am literally 15 steps from it. If there wasn't all of our equipment, I could see it right here. For Christmas one year, she got me a Peloton bike. <laughs> it's different. Why is it different? <laughs> I thought we're all equals. I thought, like, are we progressive? Are we all equals? Are we all this? Like, are, don't, like I don't understand. How is that different? <laughs> oh, shoot. <That's laughs> she can tell me I need a Peloton bike when I don't ask for it, but I can get her a treadmill when she does ask for it. <laughs> Just talk it out with, between the two of you. I don't need to get involved in this. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, we have. I just, you know, I just, frankly, I think her content was fantastic. And I'm certainly not going to pass up the opportunity. So, so here know, we are. I know, waiting for the next thing that you will throw back at her. She can't because it's, the, the next thing is, is that she has a present coming that, that she will absolutely fucking love. But she won't be able to show it because then we're going to look like pricks. Right? It's like, oh, look at this nice gift he got me. Like, that's not going to happen. Like, we can't do that. So I'm just going to end up eating shit. Yeah, the, tre I'm sure the treadmill she will. is now the gift of There's record. There's no will. validation because you can't flash it on, like, yeah, the treadmill is the gift of record. She totally. Will, she and there's will never going to be it. a follow up because I'm like, don't show that. Like, that's not, you can't show the showy stuff. You can only show the crappy stuff. Right? Like, that's, that's it. Uh, I'm so curious now. What did you I'm get so her? I'm so curious. I think I know which parts are going to get cut from the T2 broadcast because <laughs> we talked about a lot of tennis stuff and then we kind of didn't talk about any tennis stuff. So uh, 
I'm assuming most people will hear this conversation, uh, or at least the last half of it, uh, Tuesday on the pod, uh, which is available on Apple and Spotify. And I'm assuming the nuts and bolts of tennis and comebacks and drugs uh, will probably be on T2 uh, on, on Sunday night. But either way, uh, Kim, you never disappoint. You're always the best. Uh, at Served, me, producer Mike, the rest of the team, uh, we feel lucky that you're going to join us more often. Uh, appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate all you guys, too. Thank you. Cheers, Kim. Thanks. Thanks.